Good morning, church family and friends. Good morning. It is an amazing, radical, life-changing moment when you realize that the Old Testament, the first three quarters of our Bible that we call the Old Testament, is ultimately about Jesus. Right? How many of you have realized that yet? It's, it's, an, it's an, an awakening experience to realize that all the Old Testament is really about Jesus. It's about Jesus and our identity in him, about his clear commands for our lives, about our victorious life in him now, our inheritances both now and in eternity, in him, from him. The entire Old Testament is God, God's progressing story all the way through from the beginning of the universe to, to its end, which we are living right in the middle of now. It's all about Jesus at the pinnacle of it. It's all one big story that we are a part of. When those, eye, when those lights come on in your eyes, it is a life-changing moment. It's about Jesus. Now today, after two and a, one and a half years of following the king through the book of Matthew, that's following Jesus, if you're a guest, that's what we just finished, was a year and a half study through the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. And now we return to the Old Testament today, which is ultimately about Jesus. Okay, just want to make sure you're paying attention ultimately about Jesus. Open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1, and we kick off Courageous and Fearless, Joshua, a series in Joshua. If you're using the Bible in front of you, that's page 167, so open there, so you have that open. If you want a bulletin, sermon notes, raise your hand. Mr. Rager will put one in your hand. Thank you very much. We're going to have some fun today. Uh, let me tell you the story. How did we arrive at Joshua? Why Joshua next? And real quick, uh, before I came to Community Grace, about four and five years ago, Tiberius Rata was the interim pastor, and he preached through the book of Genesis. And I listened to a lot of those um, sermons, and that was great. So I came, and I decided to start in the book of Colossians, and a lot of us were together through that. That was wonderful. And then I wanted to go back to the Old Testament and where to pick up, except where Tiberius left off, and that was Exodus. And that turned out to be one of my favorite journeys ever, going through the book of Exodus, just seeing week after week after week how much the Old Testament foreshadows Jesus and his church and his whole unfolding plan of redemption and the cross and where we're going from here. Step after step from uh, the nation of Israel. God had promised Abraham back in Genesis. Well, actually, let me, let me show a picture here. Okay, so here's the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Pentateuch means five books. It's also called the Torah, which is the law. So Genesis, and then this church went through Exodus, and I had to decide, am I going to go verse by verse through Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? I don't have enough years left of preaching to go through all these books. And so we refer to the, to the Torah all the time when we're talking about Scripture, when we're talking about Jesus. So we're going to go right to Joshua. And let me just, I'm going to build uh, the foundation in the background. You see on your notes, it says background, second chances and great inheritances. Let me just build where we are, so in case you know nothing about the Bible, uh, you're going to understand where we are right now. God told Abraham, we call him Father Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, I'm going to give you a land. I'm making you a great people. All the nations, people groups of the world will be blessed through your seed, which is Jesus. Very good. Okay, he, but he promises them a land. Of course, after Joseph, they're in Egypt, and they become slaves for hundreds of years. They were 400 years in Egypt, most of those as slaves. They cry out to God, and we learn in Exodus that when we cry out to God, does he hear us? Yes, absolutely, and he still does today. When you're in trouble, cry out to God. And he hears and he rescues us. He sent them a rescuer. His name was Moses. That's the second most common question in Bible trivia games. Jesus, Moses. Your 50% chance you're going to get the right answer. Okay. Moses is the rescuer. And it turns out, sure enough, the New Testament says he was a picture, a foreshadow of the ultimate rescuer, Jesus. Very good. Now, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, God establishes his laws for life. Many of those were moral laws, and those are still in effect today. Many of them were ceremonial laws and civil laws, 
which Jesus fulfilled entirely. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Jesus. At the end of Deuteronomy now, flash forward to the end of the Pentateuch, Moses is 120 years old and about to die before the people could inherit the land that was promised, the promised land. After not being allowed to enter it himself because he sinned, he calls over and hands over the reins of leadership to the young man who he'd been training for leadership. His name was our man, Joshua. Now, why weren't the people and Moses allowed to enter the promised land under Moses? And that's where we see on the top of your notes, background, second chances, and great inheritances. It's because the Israelites sinned greatly. They rejected God, they complained against God, they cursed God, and Moses disobeyed God in anger. And that was the, the judgment, God's discipline on them. That generation and Moses were not allowed to go into the land that God had promised their forefathers. And so they wandered in the wilderness for those 40 years until the next generation was ready to go under Joshua. But let me stop and ask you, have you ever failed at something? Uh, yeah. Have you ever failed at something because of sin? Because you had a bad attitude? Because you gave up? Because you didn't try? Have you ever squandered an opportunity in your life? Of course. Maybe you wasted a, prime, a number of prime years of your life living for yourself. Okay? Maybe you blew a relationship that was very valuable. Maybe you'll never be able to get it back. We all need second chances. And I'm here to proclaim good news to you, that God is a God of second chances. That's his character. And we need to know as God's people, what the book of Joshua reminds us is God gives second chances, and everyone needs second chances. So we know that God's inheritance is always attainable and available for his people. So, that is good news, amen? It is. This is God. Who is Joshua then? As we pick up in this slice of the big story of the universe that we're still living as a part. Who is Joshua? We have two things on your notes. The new leader. Let me just tell you who he was. He began as a slave. Because everybody that was born in Egypt, all the Israelites, were born into slavery. He began as Joshua the slave. His name was Hosea, given by his parents, and, J and Moses later turned that name into Mos uh, Joshua. I got this. It's a lot of people. Moses changed his name into Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. It's Yahweh that saves. That's God's personal name. So God had his hand on Joshua. Yahweh is salvation, our salvation, through Jesus, God is good. God called Moses to mentor him. Let me take you back to Exodus 17, 14, the first time we see this mentioned. The, the, then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. And from then on, we see Joshua and Moses together, the rest of the Pentateuch. And then, so we, I'm going to call him Joshua the Disciple. And we need to be all about making disciples, having mentors, disciples in our lives. And that's exactly what happened here. And this is how he was ready. We see him next going up on the mountain with Moses to hear directly from God. Exodus 24, 13. So Moses rose with his assistant, Joshua. And Moses went up into the mountain of God. So we take discipleship very seriously. We want to take it even more seriously so that every man, every woman, and every child has discipleship in their lives and is giving that as they're able to to others relationally in community. That's what Jesus' desire is for his church. That's the Great Commission, and we want to take that very seriously. Now, uh, one example here is uh, just from yesterday morning. I just wanted to show this picture. Uh, I've had eight guys <laughs> meeting in my basement every Saturday morning. And yes, Tristan's on vacation, so I told him I'm going to superimpose him in there. <laughs> and I did. These men are men who have expressed some kind of interest in seeking the Lord's direction for a possible uh, career in some kind of vocational ministry. And so we're discipling. And this is what we want for everyone in your groups, however God is shaping, calling, commissioning you in this life. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Well, Joshua became ready for his first mission, and he became Joshua the spy. And you probably heard this story before. Moses sent out 12 spies into Canaan. Ten were bad, two were good. 
Come on. You've sung that song, right? Maybe not. I don't know. It's sung a lot in my family. Okay, so ten of the spies, they spied the land. And if you're familiar with the story at all, ten of the spies said, beautiful land, but there are giants. We can't do it. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, beautiful land, there are giants. We have God, and he promised. Let's do it. The ten saw God through the problems, and the two, Joshua and Caleb, saw the problems through God. You see the difference? Joshua was maturing in the Lord, as we all should be. In all this, he became Joshua the successor. And as we near the end of Deuteronomy, that last book of the Pentateuch, pay close attention to the words that Moses gives Joshua in his commissioning of Joshua, because they're going to sound familiar to a lot of us who have been working on certain memory verses this week. This is what Moses said to Joshua as he commissioned him. Deuteronomy 31, 7 and 8. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous. For you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you, so do not fear or be dismayed. You see some familiar stuff in there? That'll be repeated pretty soon because of discipleship, because it's one big story. What's the tie-in with new inheritances? For Israelites, it was twofold. The first was new land. Now, to any nation, land means everything, including America, including any people group. You've got to have land. You've got to have a space that's yours. The word land is extremely significant to the Israelites. It will be mentioned 87 times, the word land, in the book of Joshua. It is the promised land from which their clan and their identity can develop. The second new inheritance is new life. And again, Joshua illustrates how believers today say goodbye to their old life of bondage, praise God, and enter into the new life of freedom with God in Christ, in Jesus Christ. Those are the inheritances. And there are inheritances as well. Let's get started with this glorious journey now in Joshua chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles open, Joshua chapter 1. And in this chapter, we're going to see that Jesus brings us out of bondage to death and the wilderness of sin into our inheritance. His kingdom. For the purpose of, and there is purpose, to do his kingdom work with him, with each other, that he uniquely calls you and you and you and me to. And that's why point number one is going to be God commissions our callings. And he's got one for you, and he's commissioning you for your calling and for your families and for our churches. So here we pick up. The Pentateuch ends. Moses dies. It was now time for God to move his people to the next chapter in their, in their story and in the story of the universe, entering and conquering the promised land. Do you realize again, make this very personal, this is the living, breathing word of God, do you realize that all of your life's circumstances have brought you right here to where you are today? Right here. And where you're going next. I look at some college graduates. And we're with you wherever you go. God is with you wherever you go. What's your particular calling? God commissioned Joshua to lead this stage. He's commissioning you to your callings as well. Each person there and each person here has a particular calling. Let the reader understand that as we read these verses. Verses 1 and 2. After the, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. And Joshua gets his commission. 
Here God commissions Joshua to do three things. One is to lead the people into the land. Two is to defeat the enemies. And three is to claim the inheritance. All right. They must go over this Jordan, God says. Right there. Let's look at some pictures. First, this is a picture of Mount Nebo. It's right there east of Jordan, and it's looking into the promised land. Now let's look at a picture from Mount Nebo. And you can see into the hazy distance, across the Jordan River, is Canaan, the promised land that had been promised to their forefathers, that they're ready to claim. And you see the first city that's there on the other side of the Jordan River? Jericho. And we'll arrive there in the coming weeks. This is a second exodus of God's people over a body of water. And this is important to grasp. The first one was in the book of Exodus in the nation of Israel through Moses, through the great miracle, opened up the Red Sea, and they walked across on dry land to escape Pharaoh's army. And the New Testament makes that clear. That is a picture of salvation, being rescued by Jesus into salvation through our faith, escaping bondage and the enemy. Awesome picture. But this is a second crossing over a body of water, over the Jordan River, and it's not crossing over from death to life like the Red Sea pictured. The Bible says that this one was to picture now our obedience and following God as God's people to cross over and claim the inheritance that God has given you. Ephesians 1.3 says we've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing once we trust Christ as our Savior. Now you spend the rest of your life going to claim that inheritance and grow in the awareness of what that means, of Christ in us. Okay, that's what this is picturing. So let's continue with God's commissioning of Joshua, verses 3 and 4. God continues to say, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. And then he gives the land boundaries from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river to the river Euphrates and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea going down toward the going down of the sun. That's the west. All that should be your territory. So let's look at that on a map. Mount Nebo's over here. They're looking to the promised land. Eventually the 12 tribes of Israel are going to settle in Canaan and this surrounding area. And then the boundaries that God just promised, Abraham, Isaac, all the way, they're finally realized, and we studied this in Exodus, they're finally realized in the reign of, bonus points if you get this one, King David and King Solomon. Okay, this is the promised land. And it was Solomon's sins that divided the kingdom and lost it. The Bible is, again, one long story. We are in it. Smack in the middle, maybe towards the end of it. Probably towards the end of it. But here we are. This is where we are. So let's pick up verse 5. God continues telling Joshua, No man, okay, this is my commission to you, and I'm with you, so no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God is building up some courage here in his appointed leader to do his calling just as he will with us if you're worshiping him. Now, just two weeks ago, again, we ended our series in Matthew. And if you were here two weeks ago, we studied the Great Commission. This is how the book of Matthew ends. And I just want to pull it up again and put it on the screen, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, because this is Jesus commissioning us, his disciples, his church, and look, it's the same commission that God gave Joshua way back there. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This is every nation, every people group will be blessed in Abraham's seed. That's Jesus. And he's telling us, now you carry this ball and run with it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you in his word. And then the promise, behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Listen, we've been given this mission from Jesus, the King of Kings. This is not the mediocre commission. This is the great commission. And it's the same commission. It's the same story. It's God's purpose. It's salvation through Jesus. 
that Joshua was participating as well. Now, what's the calling, the unique calling that you get to be involved with in your spheres of life? And that's what we all get to discover together and encourage each other. And Jesus is with us all the way. All the way. Sitting still, doing nothing for Jesus, it's not an option. So let's continue. Point two, God commands our growth. And he equips us to grow. And in this journey, on this mission, this glorious mission, with this glorious God, we are going to face enemies of all kinds. Enemies from within, enemies from the outside, enemies from the spiritual realm. We're going to face all kinds of enemies. God equips us with these glorious commands in verses 6 through 9. Are you ready? Verse 6, first thing, be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. They're going to receive their inheritance. And see how God uses all of us. And God's calling for our lives is huge. It's everything to us. God will be with them as he is with us in every step. But we have to obey and not waste time and not get caught up in sin. And now, verses 7 through 9, we get to our memory verses this week. And if you weren't here last week, you say, huh? <laughs> our memory verses? How many people worked on verses 7 through 9 this week? Raise your hand if you worked on them at all. Okay. Well, maybe about half here t today. There was more in the first service. This was very fun to do as a church family. I've heard a lot of people took this very seriously and worked really hard on it. I know our family was um, working on it every night. And then it dawned on us, well, the verses say to work on it day and night. So, All right, that's pretty good. If you weren't here last week, our guest speaker last week, Tom Meyer, the Bible memory man, gave a very inspiring and strengthening message about hiding God's word in our heart, which is a command, so that we can recall it to our brain in any situation that we're in, and the Spirit speaks to the word. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will bring to mind that which you've heard me say. So, it was a great appeal, and we decided as a church we're going to do these three verses, Joshua 1, 7 through 9, and it was great. So, I warned you last week, we're going to stop, turn off the PowerPoint, and say it together. All right, so let's do it. Go ahead. PowerPoint off. Everybody stand up for the, memori for the quoting of God's Word. And Ava Ashenfelter, would you please come up here, please? Come on. And anybody else? Would anybody else like to be up front saying this verse, these verses? No, I'm serious. It's an open invitation. Come on. Some of you have it down totally solid. Come on up. Mel is coming? Yeah. I didn't expect anybody to take that invitation. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. With, all, with everything that's in my head right now, there's no, I don't have a chance to say it without help. But you guys, you guys have it down, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to turn off my microphone because I'm going to say it together. If you've got it. Do your best. Okay. Joshua 1, 7 through 9. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. That was a good time to do that as a church family, and God's going to bless that. I know that it was just so good to meditate on those words over and over throughout this week. Yes. Okay, what's for next week, Shirley asks. I was going to mention that in the wrap-up today, but um, let me just, yeah, I don't have an appointed verse, but let me just, let me just tell you, 
Okay. Thanks for asking that. Just an encouragement. Whether you did that this week or not, if you did and you enjoyed it, which we did, uh, plan something for next week. That's one thing Tom Meyer said last week. If you memorize just one verse a week, then you can memorize the whole book of Titus in a year. That's great. And again, I don't want to re-preach last week, but the, the number of blessings, strength, and courage, I'm going to get to it a little bit here, uh, from memorizing the Word of God is enormous. It's, it's amazing. Uh, this is a book that we um, recommended last week, and they were, we had to get more. We ran out last week. We got a whole bunch more at the Resource Center. It's called the Truth and Grace Memory Book, and I encourage you to take it, take it home uh, and work on it for yourself or with your family, and it's got some of the key things, and I'm, let me just continue, and I'll, I'll refer to this again, but surely ask what's next, so I don't have a prepared answer, but let's figure it out, right? Okay, maybe something from Joshua 2. That'll be fun. Now, where am I? I don't even know. <laughs> let's, let's divide the word, rightly divide the word. Let's let, dive into these verses. 7 and 8. Hear from the word of God. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that my, Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it, from the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. What words of life. Joshua's and the people's then and our now, our strength comes from, our strength and our courage comes from what? According to this verse right here. It's in italics. It's from meditating on the Word of God. We live in a time that there are so many distractions from screens to temptations to sports and hobbies and clubs and schoolwork and work and stress and savings and debt and all those things. This is priority. And it will bring strength and courage, prosperity and success to all the rest of them. Don't deny God and His power and His working in your life. Now, this is not a guarantee that we will all be wealthy and healthy, and that has grown to become a massive teaching over the world, and it's born out of America. It's called the prosperity gospel and lots of different forms now. As time goes on, it keeps evolving. And there's this manipulation of using verses like this to say that God promises you, if you just pray enough and have enough faith and send me enough money, that he will increase that tenfold, a hundredfold. Sow that seed. It is God's will for you always to be healed. That is so anti-biblical, so wrong, and so popular. And those people will stand account before God condemned if they don't repent. I just want to protect you from all the influence that's out there that teach those kind of things. God's will is often for us to suffer and grow in our sanctification through that. Now, however, he's never going to leave us, though, and he will strengthen us and, and give us courage, comfort in the face of all of it. That's a whole other sermon, and it's a great one. <laughs> now, but I, what, what I do want to point out, though, is also the biblical truth that it's no mystery. There's a general truth that if you're living by biblical principles and obeying him, you are going to be holistically healthier. Hey, you're going to be taking care of yourself and not falling into all kinds of, of unhealthy things and unhealthy relationships. And economic prosperity is, and freedom, they're founded from the Word of God. And so we should expect an economy to grow by any people, any group of people, big or small, that's applying God's Word. Holistic health and economic development are God-glorifying things that advance the gospel. And so we should expect to see that, and we have seen that in America's history, to be sure. As flawed as it is, we have seen that very thing. So you can continue to apply all of God's principles and expect those things. Just have the right view of God and his word, and you have to know his word to know that. Just remember, health and wealth make terrible gods. Okay, They make terrible idols. Just worship God. Obey him, follow him, meditate on his word. 
and see what he has for you. It'll be great. The secret of Joshua's victories was not in his skill, but in his submission to the word of God and to the God of the word. And that's the secret right there. Our faithfulness, love, and worship of God to claim our inheritance that he has for us. And you'll only know him and that if you study the word of God. So let's return to it. Verse 9. A command for our growth. He repeats it a third time so that it sticks. Again, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Joshua's like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it, all right. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed or discouraged, whatever version you use. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I hope that you were strengthened this week by meditating in these verses. I was. I had a good time with God being strengthened by this scripture. This starts in our homes because the family is the basic building block of society. That's how God ordained it from the very beginning. Now, if you're a builder and you go into the shop and you have building blocks and they're crumbling before you even get them out of the shop, what's the structure that you're building outside going to look like? Okay, and our families in America are crumbling. They're crumbling. And this is on us to lead them well. They're crumbling. What's, what's making them crumble? It's brokenness of all kinds, selfishness of all kinds, absence, bad theology, abdication of masculine strength in the home and feminine strength in the home, of leadership and of virtue. And here's what we need to do, is disciple our families in the word of God day and night. As we rise up, as we walk by the way, as we lie down, all the time, we're people of God. Now, you may need to make some changes in your household to give that priority, but it's important. Fathers, you carry that responsibility and will answer to God for how you've done. That's why we're in a season through Joshua, to be strengthened, to be courageous, to be equipped, to be forgiven. God's the God of second chances. He is good. We're going to get through some hardcore topics uh, through these next four weeks as we go, but it will be a strengthening season. And we must never retreat because Jesus, our King, is the King of Kings. And by retreating, the world loses out on the gospel that it needs so badly, and we make Jesus look like a second-rate King. There's no need to retreat. He's with us all the time. Now, the antidote to fear and dismay, he keeps saying, do not fear, do not be dismayed. And he says, here's the antidote to fear and discouragement and dismay. It's constant practice of being with God always. Many of you have played sports, and so you've practiced. Many of you have played an instrument, and so you've practiced. Many of you have learned a skill, maybe for work or something, something that you have to perform in front of people. Now, if before you practice... Um, it's hard to perform in front of people courageously. You're scared. You're really, really nervous. We just experienced that on the stage, quoting three memory verses that didn't go all that well. But that's okay. Back in Washington several years ago, I used to coach a high school boys team. And I was in a district where all the guys that I inherited had never played competitive golf before. And most of them had never swung a club before. But I had a few weeks to get them ready to start playing matches against other schools in front of people. So what did we do? What do you do when you need to get strong and courageous confidence? What we do is you master the basics, right? You master the basics and you practice them so much that it builds confidence and courage. When game time comes, you'll be confident, you'll be courageous. So everyone here has likely mastered some kind of skill, whether work or something, that you can perform in front of people. I know Tristan works with our musicians here on the worship team with this very goal in mind, and we thank you for your work. His goal is that they're so familiar with the music they're going to play on Sundays that they can be freed to worship God while they lead us. Isn't that neat? That's what we're talking about. You practice. This is exactly what God is saying for our spiritual prosperity and success. Master the basics be in his word, talk to him, enjoy him, seek him, be with his people, do all the basics that he told us to do. It's great. If we forget the basics, that's when we lose our confidence and strength, 
and we start losing the game and life spins out of control. Keep seeking God, obeying him, knowing what he says. So again, remember, number one, God commissions our callings. It's great. He's got our lives in his hand. Number two, God commands our growth. So be strong and courageous. And chapter end, one ends with all of this put into motion now. Revealing third, that God guides our commitments. When we commit our lives to be faithful to him, he's going to guide us. And we're reading a narrative book of the Bible. So let's pick up and see what happens next in the narrative, in the story. And we'll end with this. God teaches that we're never to do this alone. We're community. We're in, interdependent on each other. That's his design. In Exodus, Moses set up a great organizational structure for the nation of Israel. Joshua inherits that. They're organized. We're in this together. The church follows that same organizational structure from Exodus today. In verse 10, the scene changes from God's instructions to Joshua to Joshua's instructions to his staff, to his officers, and then their commitments back to him. So let's look at these points in these verses and we learned first that leaders commit to their people. Let's see all this in motion. It's time for the work to begin now. It's not just theory anymore. With all God's purposes and promises in hand, we go forward. Let's see what they did. Verses 10 and 11. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people. There's two or three million people in the nation of Israel at this time. So that's a big organization, right? So he's being a leader. He's got his, his officers. Tell everybody, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. He's preparing his officers to prepare the people just like any boss would to her staff or any pastor to, to his staff or any father to his family. We prepare the people who are following us, depending on our leadership. What he says is in three days, we're going across the Jordan River. Be ready so they can get ready. We're going to take possession of Canaan, the promised land. Now, I don't want to skip these last verses here. And there's some, this is real history, what happens next. What we're ending with, there's this little twist. And we can pull out some great stuff from here. There are two and a half of the 12 tribes of Israel who will not be living in Canaan. And remember, there are giants in Canaan. It's going to be a tough battle. The Reuben, Gad, half-tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, God had granted them land on the east of Jordan, not even in Canaan, but God's desire was that all 12 tribes are unified and on this mission in this battle. So it's up to Joshua now to lead, and here's what he does. Here's what it looks like, verses 12 through 15. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord, your God, is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But I'm calling all the men to join the mission. All the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord is, your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it. The land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. That's on the east of Jordan. This is beautiful. This is God leading Joshua. Unify everybody for this mission that I gave you, including these two and a half tribes. Tell your officers, lead the people, be unified. And what can stand in the way of a unified people? People of God. Nothing. That's cool. Nothing except we'll see as the chapters continue, except sin. That's the only thing. So leaders in this room, take note of how to lead the people who look up to you in life. Leaders commit to their people and do the hard task of leading. And now we see what honors God and brings the victory. That's point B that brings it complete when people commit to their leaders that are faithful to God. If any of the tribes had decided, we're out, we're not going to do this, we're not going to commit to God, we're not going to commit to our leaders, 
this new nation would have collapsed before it was even established. But they didn't. I mean, there were giants in the land. They could have gotten cold feet. They could have made excuses. They could have rebelled, but they didn't. They came together, and here were their words back to Joshua. We'll end with this. They answered, and they answered Joshua. All that you have commanded, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. What a great prayer for Joshua, their leader. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Now that seems pretty strong, but this was a life or death situation. And look what they tell him back. Only be strong and courageous. Pray for your leaders. It benefits everybody. This is a model attitude. In Community Grace family, we are growing in our influence in the world. That is a stewardship that we have. Praise God. And God is going to continue that if we do everything that we've heard today. Continue that in your own life and in your spheres and in your households. So let's do that. So here are two next steps toward being courageous and fearless people of God. The first is you've got to be a person of God. You've got to find salvation in Jesus alone. If you remember the name Joshua, like the name Jesus, means Yahweh is salvation. You've got to humble yourself before God and turn to him. That means repenting and believing and receiving his salvation, which is Jesus, his son, our atonement for sin. It wipes sin away and gives us new life. Have you found that yet by repenting and receiving Jesus? And if you have not, come and experience new life today and eternal life forever. And be a person of God and the people of God. And that's all I need to say. The Holy Spirit will prod you and pull you in if it's time, if he's calling you. That's awesome. But we are here to open the book and to walk with it walk with you through it today and for the rest of our lives. So following that, our task after that, number one task really is to make God's word central, make God central. This is his word. Careful to obey it, unified as his people. I'd say join Community Grace. We have a membership class coming June 3rd. You can explore that. You can attend the class and then decide if you want to make that commitment. Be involved in the things that we're doing here. We are stronger together. Take these steps and see that the Lord is good and he is with us. Amen? All right. Let me pray and then we'll respond in our worship and go throughout the day. And Lord, again, you've spoken through your living, breathing, active word of God that's able to penetrate and divide our hearts, our souls, our spirits. And I pray that you're doing that right now. And in our singing and our praying, we return our worship to you. And in our resolve and our commitment to follow your commission and be equipped and be together and be strengthened. Oh, we thank you that you're a good God. We face our enemies with strength and courage. We give you our lives and pray for your special blessings from today on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.